Hey, we all know climate change uh, manifests as global warming and further manifesting as the rising intensity and frequency of extreme weather events, storms, um, sea level rise, um, drought, and we have increased hurricane damages, loss of tourism revenue, infrastructure damage, and of course death and so forth. And it's projected that the cost of not dealing with climate change, um, which is projected to increase significantly by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a scientific body who assesses the research on this, um, is that by 2050, um, the Caribbean will have annual costs of 22 billion annually and 46 billion by 2010. And those are the conservative estimate. And these are about 20, 10 to 20% of our current GDP. And as you know, we just talked about the fact that we have challenges growing GDP and we have factors that will be leaking out whatever growth that we, are, that we manage to, to promote. So hmm? Climate finance is a specific flow of money that is a binding obligation, an obligation, not voluntary, a binding obligation of developed countries. And it arises out of the historical responsibility of developed countries. That science has said that at least 70% of the accumulated greenhouse gases that exist in the atmosphere today creating global warming comes from the development trajectory of the countries of Western Europe, Canada, Australia, etc. The fact is that developing countries are the ones who are going to feel those impact the most, those we, though we are at the least cause for that problem. The other fact, of course, is that we are contributing, because as we are developing and growing, we are also emitting, so we're contributing to the present and future level. So we need to go on a different path, a low carbon emission pathway, which means renewable energies and a whole host of different ways of developing, and that costs money. And so the convention set up a financial mechanism through which the developed countries would put the money through, and that money would then be redistributed to developing countries. And that's what we're calling climate finance. But we have some principles that were, uh, came from the convention. Um, and the convention says that um, fundamentally climate finance should be new, which means that it shouldn't be, uh, you shouldn't distort the flow of ODA, right? So it should be new, it should be additional, it should be predictable and adequate so that developing countries can, can um, plan. And many of us who are in the gender community and climate justice community also put some other principle on to talk about corrective justice, distributive justice, inclusiveness, country driven, that the finance should be country driven and it should be available by direct access. The countries used to have to go through the UN agencies to access climate finance. Now the government itself can apply. The instruments are grants primarily. We would like, developing countries would like it to be primarily grants and if loans at all, very concessional loans. And it's supposed to support mitigation and technology transfer and capacity building. So currently, um, developed countries have promised $100 billion per year. They have powers to mobilize, let me correct myself. $100 billion per year by 2020, and under the Paris Agreement, which was signed last December, that has been extended to 2025. And a significant proportion of that money should go to a, an entity that was established called the Green Climate Fund. And currently, the Green Climate Fund has received commitment from the developed countries of $10.2 billion, of which about $6.5 billion is actual money that the Secretariat can utilize. At the same time, the developed countries um, have created their own bilateral flows uh, that they wanted to control. And the multilateral development banks, such as the World Bank, also have created their own funds, the climate investment funds and so forth. So these are all part of the universe of climate finance. And women advocates within the climate change arena uh, have argued that, and have argued strongly and successfully, um, that gender is an important dimension of climate change. And that women, uh, if developing countries are affected worse by climate change, within developing countries, women are affected even worse by climate change. And we have lots of data and statistics to show that when it comes to hurricane storms and so forth, women die more they, 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 because of the various cultural and also other kinds of social reproduction duties that they have. So there are many literature linking gender and climate change, so that's not a debate anymore. Uh, the debate has been 
um, we accept that gender is important adaptation because agriculture and food security, but there's been a little bit of tension of saying gender is important in mitigation, and increasingly we're doing more work to show that yes, it actually is important um, in terms of women's access to energy, women's ability, and women's and small businesses to integrate into the value chain of re, uh, renewable energies and so forth. So a lot of that work is going on. So in the context of the UNFCC, as a result of the work of gender advocates, there's at least 50 decisions uh, at each conference of the party promoting gender, initially talking about gender balance in delegations, and now we've gotten them to talk more about gender equality in climate change adaptation and mitigation policy. And the best expression of that is in 2014, we had the Lima Work Program on Gender, which was a two-year program to really target more closely the relationship between gender and adaptation and capacity building, gender mitigation and uh, technology. And now all of our governments, including all of the governments of CARICOM, last year submitted what I call Intended Nationally Determined Contribution, INDC, which are plans that said this is how I plan to contribute my share towards reducing global emissions. And um, the INDCs consisted of um, mitigation, adaptation, and finance and technology on the part of developing countries. Developed countries submitted INDCs that were primarily mitigation focused. These INDCs are lasting for five years and they have to be reviewed every five years up until 2025. And the push is to gender sensitize those so that we have a gender responsive um, response to climate change and also within the context of the, the climate funds. Many developing countries have created their own national climate change funds. So the Ind Indonesia has a national climate change fund. The Philippines has developed what is called a People's Survival Fund. It's a special fund that comes out of the national treasury and it's meant to finance adaptation and, and projects. That's something that we need to think about uh, if our countries have are in the process of establishing national climate change strategy if they do, and then the next step is are they setting up these funds? That we need to really be looking at to what extent financing these climate change will impact the national economy, the fiscal budget, and also to what extent it will impact uh, causing governments to make trade-offs, right? Do we do poverty eradication or do our mitigation commitment? Do we do sanitation and water or do we do our adaptation commitment? So it's important to make sure, and that's my job and the jobs of my colleagues at the South Center to work, to make sure that the Annex One, the developed countries, actually push and provide the financing and upscale their financing. Your job here is to make sure that that financing comes in, is tracked, is used efficiently and adequately, and to further make sure that you all get involved in the INDCs. So as we review our INDC, we need to put in there the role of MSMEs, the role of women in communities, small community groups, where these things are going.